It is my pleasure to be able to introduce Kathy Robertson. Kathy is the executive director of the Cleveland County Abuse Prevention Council. She's been executive director for the Abuse Prevention Council since November 1st of 2007. Um, Mrs. Robertson has worked in social services since 1987 and has a broad background in social services that includes serving as a liaison between county and state government to implement changes to children's mental health care services, working as a senior planner for Workforce Investment Act services, supervising a one-stop career center, directing family services for a Salvation Army local office, and providing vocational and mental health counseling services. Mrs. Robertson relocated to Shelby in August of 2007 with her husband, Cal, who is a professor of biblical studies at Garner Webb School of Divinity, and her sons, Warren and Samuel. Um, Mrs. Robertson has also served on the board of directors of Partners Behavioral Health as a past chair of the Cleveland County Schools Head Start Policy Council and Gaston Lincoln Cleveland Community Care com, um, Continuum of Care for Homeless Services. She currently serves on the Cleveland County Commission for Women, Cleveland County Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, and the Cleveland County Child Fatality Review and Child Protection Review Teams. Mrs. Robertson attends Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, where Dr. Robertson is associate pastor and where she sings in the choir and performs with the handbell choir. She is a native of Cedartown, Georgia, and holds a Master of Social Work degree and a Certificate in Theology from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. So please join me in welcoming Kathy Robertson. Thank you. That's a lot of information about me. Um, but anyway, now you know it all. <clears throat> I'm glad to present today about accessing transportation for victims of domestic violence. Um, I don't have any um, great solutions. We struggle with transportation just like everyone else does, especially people in a rural area. In fact, we just lost our contracted transportation provider and here we go again. But I'm glad to share mm -hmm. with you what I know. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, whenever you're looking for resources for your clients, the best place to start is what with what public resources are there? What are our tax dollars already paying for? And North Carolina, um, perhaps only on paper, I'm not sure about other areas, but every area in North Carolina is covered by some kind of public transit agency that receives tax dollars. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, if you need to know who that is, um, there's a link right here. And my understanding is you'll probably get these PowerPoints as an email after this session. So if you will go to this website um, and you can find services by county or put in your area and it will take you to a link uh, to those transportation services. In our county, uh, we contacted, we moved to a new location back in 2018 and we contacted our county transportation agency and said, hey, here we are. And actually we were moving around the corner from them and we said, you know, how can you help? Because we're a little bit more out of town than we used to be. And they added a bus stop across the street from us. We said, well, they, they said we can add a bus stop. And I said, please not on our property because, you know, we don't need people hanging out on our property. Um, and they added a stop for us uh, right now, even though our transportation is limited. Um, all of the trips in the transportation um, from public transportation are free uh, and have been since the beginning of COVID. But most interestingly, what they do, and I don't know that all counties do this, but they contract uh, with nonprofits to provide uh, transportation. So we're in con uh, conversation with them since we lost our provider. Um, with you know what next steps are so that we can contract with them to provide those transportation services if you can go to the next slide what we've been doing before then was um working with private contracted services um, in rural areas there are not a lot of those options around um, we did a google search to see who was out there and not much but the best place to look for a private contracted services 
service would be with someone else in your community who is already using those services. School systems do a lot of transportation. Hopefully school systems are providing transportation for the children in your shelter to make sure that they can get to their home schools. Mental health providers um, and other community organizations are already contracting with people to tr provide transportation. Um, so they've already done the work. Ask them uh, a great chance to do some outreach, uh, connect with people in your community and let them know what you're doing. Uh, but it's important to know some things about contracted services. Uh, you need to know what kind of screening are they doing with their uh, for their drivers? Uh, do they have insurance? Uh, what are their fees? Uh, how will they notify you if there is a change in their fees, which is why we no longer have a, a provider because they all of a sudden doubled their fees. Uh, and some others, what it, and, um, what is their billing policy? Do they expect to be paid up front? Many contracted service or, or private service providers work on a cash, cash basis, which of course doesn't work for um, transportation that you want to pay for through grant money. Are they able to create an invoice? If they can't give you an invoice, you can't pull down grant money. Uh, and you probably need to lay eyes on that invoice um, before you, you go ahead and agree to um, provide those services. And while I call this contracted services, we actually don't have a contract with anyone. It's really on a, a pay per service basis of what we've done, um, what we've done in the past. Okay, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, whatever you're going to do, whether you're providing uh, services through your agency vehicle and staff are providing those services, whether you're going with public transportation and paying on a, a per trip basis or you're using a private provider, you need a policy in place for lots and lots of reasons. So you can move to the next slide. This is our policy and I'm not gonna read through it right now, but just so you know, our policy says what we're gonna do and what we're not going to do. Uh, but if you'll move on to the next slide, uh, I'll tell you that uh, give you a list of things that we considered ahead of time. Uh, you need to think about what kind of transportation you're going to provide. So we provide transportation to medical appointments and other essential appointments. We don't provide transportation for daily people who are um, going to the community college. We don't have enough staff to do that. Uh, when, during the day, do you have enough people if you're providing that person that uh, with your staff? Um, if you are using staff, go ahead and have a disclaimer saying, if somebody's out sick and we can't provide your transportation, there's not a lot we can do about that. Uh, but also things like who's responsible for the vehicle, because I, we all work in agencies where we're sharing resources. If everyone's responsible, no one will be responsible. Uh, who's going to keep that vehicle clean? Can your passengers eat in your vehicle? We don't do that uh, because we learned the hard way. Um, Who's going to make sure that there's gas in that vehicle so you don't have co ca staff conflict like you would at home about uh, you left the vehicle empty? Who can drive? What's your insurance's policy? Um, who does the background check on those policies? Um, hopefully your insurance company because it's expensive. Um, do you want to provide a camera for staff safety? At one point we had a male who was driving, uh, we're doing a lot of transportation driving our van and he was more comfortable just having a, 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 a camera that pointed back into the vehicle just so there would be no uh, concerns about what happened in that vehicle. Um, should passengers ride in the front seat? Uh, so if you think of someone as having a mental health crisis or maybe, you're driving with someone and you're getting close to where their abuser lives unknown to you and they panic and drive your steering wheel. Is that something that you want to, to plan for in advance? What do you do if a client is having a mental health crisis and is no longer safe in your vehicle or want, want, wants to jump out? Talk about those things ahead of time so that staff know what to do when there's a crisis. What are your policies around um, your staff speeding and, and, and safely um, transporting people. What's your car seat policy? Uh, make sure that you know what the car seat laws are and that you're following the law. If you're not, you're going to be liable if something goes wrong. Who, if you have car seats, who's responsible for those? 
Um, what does your insurance company think about what you're doing with car seats? Who's installing those car seats? Because there is a process to installing car seats. Is that the staff or is it the client who's being responsible, responsible for installing those? Are your staff trained to install car seats? If they're not, who in your community does that training? There's someone in every community who does that in our community. It's the fire department. Um, um, and this is this is something that we I was on vacation and we dropped the ball on. If you're using paid uh, services, how are you going to handle? How are you going to communicate with your provider if there's an emergency high risk transportation? We messed up very recently uh, and didn't fully um, inform a driver, but our clients did as soon as they got in the car and they were really upset with us. Uh, and our policy is we make mistakes. When we make a mistake, especially on things that don't happen often, we're going to write up a policy. So the next time we're doing this thing, you pull out the policy and, and part of that policy says, don't forget to tell the driver. Um, and um, and I have a question. Um, what training, if any, do we require for uh, people who the staff who drive? Uh, we go through our policy thoroughly, but we don't. We haven't ever uh, provided outside training. Uh, we want to see their driver's license and our insurance uh, performs a background check. But heads up about background checks. Go ahead and run. You know, I don't. You should. Hopefully, you know that you cannot run a background check on someone before you hire them but make sure you run that background check including if your insurance company is doing the driver check right after you hire them because we ended up with someone who um our insurance company said uh you're not putting him he's not going on this insurance and and here we are stuck with someone who is already trained but can't fulfill his function of driving the vehicle because of his driving record. <clears throat> and I will say at this point, I'm over my time, but I can't remember if there's another slide or not. Uh, so if there is, if you can, yes. Oh yes, funding. Um, transportation is a required service, so you have to fund it. That's just, that's a fact of life. Um, add it to your budget at the beginning of the program year. Put a line item in every grant when you create your budget, even if you only put a placeholder there. Write many grants, um, carefully consider using volunteers. We don't, you might need to, or you might have volunteers who you trust. And that's my presentation and that's my time's up. Hey, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and really heartening to hear about the bus stop. Um, you answered the one question we got in the chat. So maybe we have time for just one more in case anybody has one and wants to ask it off of mute. Okay, well, if we get any by email, Kathy, we'll be certain to send those along. Okay, so, Carrie Ann, I think I'm going to turn it back to you to introduce our next presenter. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy and Jess. Um, our next presenter to elaborate in a different style about access to transportation and share a little bit more is Linda Holden Cox. Linda is the executive director of the Wayne Uplift Resource Association and has been with them for 26 years, um, has had 26 years of experience in designing, implementing, and managing human service programs. Linda began her career as a family service worker in 1986 after graduating from Fayetteville State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Sociology. During her tenure at Wayne Uplift Resource Association, she has been instrumental in the development of the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Program. The program consists of a safe shelter, crisis lines, victim and court advocacy, support groups, and supportive services. Linda has a passion to serve and has dedicated most of her career to breaking the cycle of domestic violence. She is married to a devoted husband who is supportive of her career and they have two adult children. Linda enjoys spending time with her family and visiting the beach and the mountains. So South uh, North Carolina is a great place to live because we got both. So I want to give a warm welcome to Linda Holden Cox and we're so grateful to have you here today, Linda. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Okay. 
Um, I will be sharing um, a brief process of how our agency conducted um, the whole, um, conducted the process of purchasing a van. Okay, and I think we can skip the first one or two slides because that's just an introduction to me, which has already been done. And we're going to go straight into the needs assessment. Um, and for all of uh, the service providers on the on the call, you know that once you are actually implementing a new service or programs, you got to do that needs assessment. And there's nothing different than um, when you want to buy something as well. And so we actually conducted a needs assessment. We actually looked at all the data that we had gathered from our grant reports that we submit on the quarterly and semi-annual basis. Um, and we just reviewed all the services that we had provided within the last year, year and a half. We looked at the number of individuals that we transported, uh, including the adults and children, uh, the number of vouchers that we had distributed for the use of our local transit system, um, the number of uh, bus tickets that we had purchased for Greyhound, <laughs> the number of times staff have actually provided uh, transportation services, and the number of times that we've actually uh, had a call on Lyft or Uber. So with that being said, we once we gather all that information, it was concluded that we would be more efficient in providing transportation services if we had a vehicle. So we actually, the next slide. And of course, we had to take it to the board of directors. I took all that data uh, to the board uh, of directors and so they can approve the funding. Um, spending of the funding to purchase the vehicle. I also solicited um, some support from the Board of Directors by uh, creating a search team, um, a search committee rather, uh, which included our finance officer and at least one other person. And that was, turned out to be really good simply because the other one person that was on that committee um, knew uh, two of the general managers uh, for the local dealerships here. So that turned out to be really great. She actually kind of paid the path for me to actually go in and, and, and talk with them. So the next slide. I'm not seeing the text on the next slide. Can anyone see that? Okay, can you go, okay. Can you go back <laughs> right there? Here we are. Vehicle search. Okay. Establish a budget. Fortunately, uh, we had a major funding source that um, had a lot of some one time funding. Um, and so once we got word of that, we decided that we were going to do it was only for one one year. And so we knew we couldn't add it in staff support or uh, anything that we would have to continue to, to fund. And so we automatically thought about the transportation services. So we didn't pretty much have to establish a budget. The budget, the, the amount was already there. And so I was able to take that amount to the board of directors and they approved um, for us to actually spend that amount towards purchasing the vehicle, the insurance, the registration ties and all of that. Okay, once that was approved by the board of directors, then we decided we had to decide on what type of vehicle we wanted. So again, we went back to our data um, that we had gathered through the last year, year and a half, and looked at the size, the average size of families that we were serving. Were we serving more uh, families or individuals in the transportation area? And so that, you know, helped us decide on what type of vehicle we needed. If we wanted a compact vehicle, midsize, SUV, or a van. And of course, we chose the van simply because it's a lot easier to install car seats or booster seats or if we're locating a family out of town and they have luggage or totes and things of that sort, it was just a uh, uh, um, lot more feasible for us to actually select the van. And so we chose the van. And from there, uh, as I said, one member of the search committee actually uh, made contact with some local dealerships. And so we went into the dealership uh, and this was in the midst of the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, you all rather. Uh, and so we made a lot of phone calls in the very beginning, but um, we made calls, we uh, scheduled times to go in. And once we told them what we were looking for, they actually pulled those vehicles, had them available for us to take a look at. As soon as we got there, we test drove the vehicles. Um, we sat down and talked to them about the warranties that, on the vehicles as well. And I was doing all of this with at least one or two people, the search team at all times. Um, and so once we looked at two 
um, visit two dealerships here in town. We actually thought to let's go out of town too to see if we're going to get a you know a better deal because we were also on a you know searching on the internet and trying trying to see who had the, you know who was having sales and and everything because it was close towards the end of the year, which they say is the best time to purchase a vehicle October November. So we actually decided to go out of town as well. We search on the internet and then um, schedule some visits out of town. Um, so we went to Fayetteville and um, we, you know, looked at the dealership there, we uh, test drove the vehicles and looked at the warranties um, that they had to offer as well. And um, we did select uh, a vehicle out of town. We drove to Fayetteville uh, to test drive and, and talk with the dealership there. And then um, they held the vehicle for us, for us to come back in town and try to work out a deal. Uh, in town, that didn't happen as we um, didn't expect it to happen. We, we gave it a try anyways, but um, we actually um, just let the vehicle um, out of town, which was in Fayetteville. Um, once we knew the vehicle that we were going to get, we asked them, you know, they still held the vehicle for us, and we actually contacted our insurance agent. And if you could actually go to the next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide? I don't know what happened there. Maybe the slides will catch up with us. <laughs> I'm going to continue them. I'm, I'll stop sharing and reshare. So okay. Well, we're, we're seeing at, right now, Linda, we were seeing the make the purchase slide. Okay. I'm on contact insurance agent. <laughs> contact the insurance agent is the slide we're looking for. That's what well, we I, see. Okay. Contact insurance agent. I don't see it on my, on my end, but I can just go ahead for the second time. Yes, once we uh, asked the dealership to hold the uh, the uh, vehicle for us, we did at that time contact our insurance agent who actually um, gathered quotes for us, or take quotes for us for all the other insurance coverage that we here, have here at our agency. And they did uh, the research and, and sent back three quotes. Um, the search team and I actually reviewed those uh, quotes and uh, chose the agent, that, um, the company that we wanted to go with. And then so... Once we had the insurance, we contacted the um, dealership in Fayetteville and uh, scheduled an appointment to purchase the vehicle. So the one um, individual from the search team and myself actually drove to Fayetteville and we um, made the purchase. And so, and then the last slide should show our vehicle that was purchased in 2020. As I said, this was at the beginning of the pandemic and <laughs> We were very lucky to to be able to go into the dealerships and, and do the test driving and, and speak with the individuals face to face. But it was a um, it seemed like a long process at the time that we actually were going through it. But at the end, when I look back and um, did all of that, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't such a long process. And looking at this last slide, I'm thinking I need to go back because there is one major slide that we skipped because I didn't have it on the screen. But one of the major slides that I want to, yeah, before make a purchase, attain, uh, and that slide would be, okay, insurance. We're seeing obtain quotes for full coverage on the, VD, on the vehicle. Okay, and we have to, do you have the slide attain funding um, approver, funder approver? That right there, <laughs> the major slide <laughs> out of all the slides. I think this is one of the attaining approval from the board of directors and attaining uh, approval from your funding source. Uh, of course, this was a huge purchase. So once the funding source, once we, we did have a phone con we made phone contact, with the funding source to let them know what we were going to, you know, what we wanted to do. Um, and we already had the guidelines. We already knew the guidelines um, that we had to follow to make this purchase. And so once we got 
all the quotes in town and out of town from the dealerships. We actually put a package together and we submitted those quotes to our funding source. Then they have to approve before we can move further. And that turnaround time was about two weeks. So that is one of the major um, steps in this whole process, board approval and getting approval from your funding source. Even though the money, they have a lot of this money for you to spend, you know, um, as long as it's appropriate, you know, within the grant guidelines or whatever, but that it's a piece of equipment, it's a, it's a vehicle. So uh, of course you have to get uh, approval from your funding source. And so that's what we did, submitted all the quotes, they gave us approval. And then once they gave us approval, then we, we went to the issuance. Um, and from there, uh, the steps that I share with you all. So that was it. Thank you so much, Linda, and congrats on the final purchase. That's wonderful. We didn't get any yes. questions in the chat during your presentation, so I'll just pause for a moment to see if anybody has a question they want to ask off mute. Great. Well, thanks so much, Linda. Really appreciate it. And You're I welcome. see we have we have Cricket back. So Cricket, I think I'm going to turn it to you to introduce our next presenter. Awesome. Thank you. Great job, Linda. Um, <laughs> so Annette Taylor is our next um, presenter, and she joined the North Carolina Department of Information Technologies Division of Broadband and Digital Equity in May of 2022 as the director of the Office of Digital Equity and Literacy. She is helping expand NCDIT initiatives to ensure all North Carolinians have equitable access to high-speed internet and digital literacy resources. And it has more than 25 years of community service and civic engagement in both public and private sector roles and in the philanthropic arena, directing resources to organizations across North Carolina. She serves as the chair for the NC Council for Women and previously as an appointee on the Domestic Violence Commission. Um, hope you guys will help me welcome Annette um, for her presentation on um, broadband. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you so much Cricket for the um, warm welcome and uh, thank you so much to you and Carrie Ann for uh, your leadership and for this invitation to uh, be a part of this discussion around access to transportation and broadband. Um, I would like to start by sharing that uh, I'm grateful to be able to say that I am a survivor of domestic violence and was blessed to be served by internet, I mean, um, Interfaith mm, Interact in Wake County um, back during that time in the uh, uh, late 90s, I guess it was, or mid 90s. Um, so I was really blessed and uh, also very honored to serve um, on the Domestic Violence Commission up until I believe last year. Um, so um, as a survivor, I certainly recognize the value that all of the service providers on the call, um, all of the work you do, and I just want to thank you so much for your service. Uh, I am very fortunate to uh, now be serving in a role that is uh, helping to close the digital divide in North Carolina, and um, that certainly starts with access to internet um, availability, and we know how important that is to surviving as well as thriving. And so uh, with that, I'm going to kind of move through my PowerPoint slide. Um, can everyone see the slide? Very good. Um, in our division, the Office of Digital Equity and Literacy that I'm serving in or leading is a part of our broadband and digital equity division that the governor established in 2021 um, with the goal of, uh, you know, allowing the more than 1 million people and households rather in North Carolina um, to get access to high speed Internet, but understood that it was important to create this office. Um, to help people to adopt it because it doesn't matter if they have access um, and availability for the broadband if they don't know how to use it, don't have those skills to use it or, or devices um, and cannot afford it. So in our office, we're focusing on adoption of it and making sure people are able to afford it and use it safely. And so when we think about um, the users on the call um, and 
folks that you are uh, servicing, uh, using it safely is very important to us. Um, over the last year or so, we have been focusing on uh, investments of the American Rescue Plan funding um, for infrastructure, uh, as well as our awareness of digital literacy. So we received more than $1 billion to be able to invest in infrastructure and getting broadband access in unserved areas across uh, the state. Um, you'll see a bulleted list there of the types that we're um, that we are deploying and we are investing in service providers, internet service providers. And to be able to do that, um, our great grants uh, are what we most recently um, distributed more than $350 million in American Rescue Plan funding for that. Um, we uh, have a goal of getting all households uh, connected, of course. And so uh, I always like to encourage people to go to our website if they want to learn more about these various infrastructure grants. We are still working on them. Our next one would be the CAB grants, completing access to broadband. But we always like to give people kind of a broad overview of ways that we are investing in our division on the infrastructure piece. Uh, and, and mapping is a big part of that, which I'm going to uh, talk about that as well. Um, the division that I'm focused on is working on uh, creating awareness. Um, to North Carolinians so that they can understand more about how to get access to affordable high-speed internet as well as um, support for digital literacy skill, kind of the basic skills and what they need to be able to um, thrive in this digital economy. Uh, there is a, a subsidy program called the Affordable Connectivity Program so that people who um, may pay more than $60 a month or so can actually get um, a subsidy. And uh, if they connect to this subsidy, they'll be able to get it possibly for free if they um, qualify for it. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and we're also focusing on investing in high quality digital literacy and skills training, as well as helping people get access to the devices that they need. So talk a little bit about that. Um, this slide is really telling you, I don't know how much it tells you, except it's red. So you'll see all of these red marks. But um, what we did um, recently was challenge the FCC maps, the Federal Communications Commission, which is the one that issues um, the maps and say where uh, served and unserved locations are. And so uh, North Carolina did issue a um, challenge in North Carolina so that uh, residents and businesses could say, whether they were being served or whether they weren't. And so this is the newest map that's been issued that really talks about where the serviceable locations are, those that are unserved and underserved. And we learned that, of course, it's a lot more than we expected. And uh, But as a result of our challenge, we were able to um, uh, be made, uh, receive investments in the state of more than $1.5 billion to be able to service over 500,000 locations uh, when we began working on that. So this is really important. I have my uh, colleague, I meant to say that this is a team effort. We do have a team in, a, uh, in the division of more than uh, 20 people. Um, and so it's a, we have a team effort and uh, I have one of my colleagues that's on, it might be putting some links inside the chat so you can learn a little bit more uh, about some of the resources. So she'll be sharing some of those and sharing a little bit more. Um, and so this slide is really letting you know that um, there are a lot of places across the state that uh, we intend to service with our uh, broadband equity access and deployment funds that will be coming in from uh, NTIA, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, which is a part of U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, this slide, and again, you all can have access to these slides. I'm sure they'll be sent out um, one important thing on this slide as I try to move a little fast is that there is the NC1 map that will provide a lot of information about eligible project areas that we're going to be serving, more information about areas that are unserved, uh, what percentages are served. It's really a platform that is available for uh, individual users as well as businesses and state government. Um, it also speaks to um, areas that have been challenged. It talks about other federal grants because other agencies are providing internet um, infrastructure grants such as the USDA. Um, and so what you'll see here are links that you can go on so that you can identify, determine whether your um, household, whether your business is being served or if it is not getting adequate internet. And so we wanna make sure that um, the your entities are 
uh, being served and that we know about them. See, that's the very important thing is that we know about them. And so we're asking organizations uh, to go on and to use this link so that you can be identified as a part of our process. We're also available um, to provide a printable map that you can kind of walk through to be able to do this independently, or we can assist you in our office. But this is a way that we know is important to promote public safety, which is uh, a key issue here. Um, it also helps lead to better government decisions um, where uh, it's necessary and internet is necessary and really um, a huge focus on just economic vitality in general. And so uh, we will be happy to have kind of one on one conversations with your organizations. Uh, but it's important for you to know that there is a platform and a resource um, for you. Uh, the other important part is that NC broadband survey. We are encouraging everyone to either call us or call a number that I think has been provided in the chat if you want to. Um, uh, challenge whether you're being served, uh, but we have a survey. And so you could take this survey and there's some links in here. Here it is. Um, it's important for us to have this up to date information on the homes and the businesses that need a high speed internet, because if we don't know it, we're not able to do it, uh, challenge it. And I know we have been talking uh, with Cricket um, in the past about um, making sure that um, there's anonymity as uh, data gets shared about um, the uh, shelters. And so uh, we just still want you to know that we're working hard and we're still interested in having conversations about um, shelters being um, deemed uh, uh, community anchor institutions and how we can maintain confidentiality at the same time. But this survey takes about five minutes to complete. It's available in both English and Spanish. Um, it would just help us to um, really um, understand where speeds need to be increased as well as uh, internet needs to be provided. So um, I think there's a new point down here. If you provide your uh, contact information, we can use this again to challenge the high speed availability. I think I said that earlier. And there's some phone numbers that are on this slide you'll have access to later. But again, in the chat, I think my colleague has um, uh, added some information about those phone numbers. So what we uh, know about adoption in North Carolina, um, an estimated 430,000 are without a laptop or desktop. This continues to add to the divide. This is an area that we're focusing on with some of our funds that we intend to invest to try to close that gap. Um, many of you were aware of this uh, during COVID where we fell into a homework gap. I think students were already challenged, but the fact that they did not have access to the internet or they did not have the proper type of devices to be able to do homework, um, for households that had people that wanted to access telemedicine. All of these are areas that we're really trying to address in the work we're doing. Um, when it comes to the workforce, we know that North Carolina jobs require at least 91% um, of North Carolina jobs require some digital skill. And I think all of us can attest to that. And we want to make sure that uh, we help people to be able to adopt it um, in the most uh, efficient and effective way to be able to attain the type of jobs that they need to make a livable wage. Um, we also know from some research from uh, the National Skills Coalition that one third of US workers do not have the foundation of digital skills. And so that's something that we're working to change. And uh, back to the affordability, more than 1 million households um, would have to pay more than 2% of their annual income to be able to afford broadband um, at the cost of $60 a month. Uh, we've been traveling across the state. We've been doing listening sessions. We're trying to understand what the challenges are in various areas, but especially in the rural areas. And we are understanding that some of those places, internet access, uh, the cost of it is uh, even upwards of $100 a month. So um, we're trying to make sure everyone is aware of the affordable connectivity program. I think there will be a link at the uh, end of this slide with all the resources, but we're trying to make as many people as possible aware of the affordable connectivity program. This slide is talking a little bit about our next grant phase. Um, we'll uh, be issuing um, a notice that we will um, invest in more digital literacy programs that community-based organizations will be eligible for. We did one at the end of last year, and at the beginning of this year, we awarded um, about 14 million to state agencies. So we've been involved in um, deploying those funds and creating our MOUs uh, so that state agencies would be able to implement digital 
inclusion programs. And so now we're going to invest an additional 14 million to nonprofit organizations and educational entities, as well as local governments to be able to expand upon their digital equity programs. And I believe that uh, entities on this call and some of you all will be able to apply, but they're listed there. Um, counties and, and per county uh, applicants will be able to apply for up to $400,000. Um, and uh, the funding would be for, well, we're hoping the funding would be for three years, um, but it needs to be obligated by the end of 2024 and spent by 2026. So that might affect that a little bit, but we will work with you on, on that. But once we release this uh, notice, applicants will have about 60 days to apply. I mentioned earlier about the Affordable Connectivity Program, which we're calling ACP. Um, it does provide up to $30 a month discount on internet services. And if folks live on tribal lands, it would be $75 per month discount. Um, you could also receive a $100 discount towards a laptop computer or a tablet, um, depending on the provider who is participating in this program. Um, we have had a goal of getting 1 million households enrolled by the end of this year. We already have over 800,000. I think I heard the governor say 815 the other day, and I didn't quite check that before we had this session today, but we have been keeping track of that. So we didn't um, change this number, but we are well above 767,000 um, as of today. Um, and we want anyone on the call who feels they're eligible for it or tell your neighbors and your friends and just uh, family members who may qualify for it, uh, please encourage them to uh, go on to the link that'll be at the end of this slide to uh, see if you qualify for ACP. And then that before, just before you go into the survey, just give yes. us a time check. Sorry, because I know we want a few minutes for the breakout session. So you're the last presenter, so you good. get punished with the short time. You. But sorry. No worries, no worries at all. Uh, and again, you know, this slide will be available to everybody. I think that they're pretty uh, self-directed, but do want to encourage people to take our digital equity survey that's listed here. Uh, it's available in the top languages spoken in the state. It only takes about 10 minutes. So we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to let us know what their needs are as it relates to accessibility, affordability, and digital skills. That link is there. I won't go into this slide. Um, here's the resource page. And so again, we wanna encourage everyone um, to look at these resources and let us know what questions you have. We're available to chat with you one-on-one -on -one as well. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you, and thank you, Emily, for the great links in the chat. Um, I'm gonna call an audible and just we'll hold questions. So if folks wanna email us or submit them in the chat, We'll get you an answer after this, but um, Dyson, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the breakout uh, slides so that we can go into our quick breakout sessions. Um, so don't do this yet, but in just a second, you're going to see at the top right of your WebEx screen, there's going to be an option for you to click the breakout session of your region or your choosing if you have a statewide reach, Western, Eastern, or Piedmont. Once you click your region, you're going to be sent to a virtual breakout session for eight minutes. At the end of eight minutes, we'll, you will be automatically sent back to this larger group. Um, and we're going to ask you to do a quick readout of your breakout session. So maybe one minute each. So the very first thing that you can do in your breakout session is to please assign a spokesperson to provide a quick readout of your group's conversation. And we're asking that that conversation center around identifying any transportation needs or barriers to broadband access that your organization or other organizations that you may work with or touch have faced while providing services to clients. And then would love you all to discuss any creative solutions that your organization has come up with to overcome those barriers to transportation needs and broadband access. Um, so I think Dyson is about to put the breakout sessions up in the top right, and then you can click and go and we'll convene back here in just a few minutes. Okay, welcome back everybody. So we're gonna do very quick readouts, like minute or less per region, trying to get y'all out on time. Um, so maybe we could start, I know our Western Breakout was small but mighty. It looked like Carrie Ann and Kathy. I may let you guys just give a quick readout of your discussion first. 
I know Kathy has to run to a meeting, so um, just really quickly talked a lot about the lack of providers period that and um, just a really strong need for quality providers and safe transportation. And then that even the broadband when you pay for the good stuff is out at least once a day every day. So we talked a little bit about the impact of the mountains on that. So. Ariane, how about our Piedmont breakout group? Okay, uh, there are a couple of things that I heard in reference to barriers to transportation, and that is that there are some counties and agencies that basically do not have a transportation system at all. And then if they have a very small um, measure of transporting people, that there are problems with the time frame. Also, there is problems with uh, unlimited stops if there is a transportation system. Also, when it comes to victim service agencies, just having adequate staffing because of the fact that sometimes two people have to ride on the car. But I also heard that people have some creative solutions, trying to make sure that when they look at their business, making sure that they have a bus stop near their agency. Um, also, when it comes to broadband, basically, there were some agencies that just basically didn't have any internet services at all, uh, that some people were having to come be, become very creative using hybrid services. Another solution was also going to the library and other places that had internet services so that people could have access, offering people laptops and computers. Those were some of the things that, in, as, as far as being creative. But there were more barriers that I heard for both uh, transportation and broadband, just, just trying to having the funds and resources to assist people with getting transportation and also with accessing broadband services. So that was just a little bit since it was only a minute. Thank you. <laughs> you, Bernetta. And how about our Eastern region? In the uh, Eastern region, we talked about um, access to transportation providers was very limited for our outer counties, um, uh, literally non-existent um, in, in at least one of them. Um, the fact that uh, the cost to provide transportation to um, victims um, who need to go to court uh, either outside of the area um, or uh, if they obtained their temporary um, DVPO but had to return and they, they were staying in their home and had to return to court without um, uh, transportation, that it's costly. Uh, you know, providers have to use um, cab service, which is costly. And um, and so that certainly in the transportation, also very early morning hours um, and and transportation providers not being available to be able to provide the transportation that might be needed if somebody's coming in from you know a bus or from an outer area that is coming into to even the the um, uh, community seeking um, safety um, was an issue. We did not, we weren't able to address the uh, broadband um, because time ran out. Sorry about that, but thank you for the transportation. So Cricket, um, Carrie Ann, gonna turn it back to y'all in the interest of time to wind us up. We just wanted to thank everyone for your contributions today. A special thank you to our presenters, Kathy, Linda, and Annette, um, for sharing such great information. A big thank you also to both Jess and Dietrich for organizing this Lunch and Learn today. And we will be sending out the additional information to everyone and um, appreciate if you have any additional questions, we'll get them to folks.